anyway, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bill Mooney, uh, President and CEO of the Westchester County Association, and thank you all for being here on this delightful afternoon. Uh, we have a lot of key leaders in our community here with us uh, this afternoon, and um, we're kind of excited to uh, welcome you to hear from our distinguished speaker, Blair Levin, who will be introduced shortly, I might add. Uh, I want to give a special thanks today uh, to my friend Bobby Knight and Harrison Edwards. Uh, uh, you can do that, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Not a bad idea, that's for sure. Uh, they are our strategic partners in this whole process, I might add. They have done a terrific job in putting our programs together as we go forward with uh, our Smart Growth Initiative and Broadband Initiative. They have been the architects of, of the whole process, uh, uh, very thoughtful and deliberate uh, disciplines they've given to us. And, and frankly, uh, we wouldn't be here today uh, and having Blair with us, if it weren't for Bobby. So, Bobby, thank you so much for. Uh, and anyway, uh, and I'd also like to thank our friend uh, Ken Theobald for sponsoring today's lunch from Entergy. If you don't give Ken, uh, just to give you a, a brief background, as most of you know, the Westchester County Association has created a, a public-private partnership with Westchester's uh, four largest cities to spearhead smart growth initiatives in Westchester County and to bring super speed broadband talent, housing, and more innovation to our region. The cities, namely, are in Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, White Plains, and Yonkers. And they have signed a smart growth uh, compact and as the first step, we'll uh, work with the WCA to bring gigabit broadband to every household, every business, healthcare, and educational organization in the next three to five years. I'm delighted that Mayor Tom Roach is with us here today. Mayor. And uh, I know that Richard uh, Thomas, uh, Mayor of Mount Vernon, is supposed to be here. I'm, I'm sure he'll be here shortly. Uh, and uh, we have representation at a high level from all of our four cities here today. In addition to our city leaders, I would like to acknowledge uh, Kevin Plunkett, who's not here yet, but will probably be dropping by at some point, and also uh, the head of economic development who's with us, uh, Bill Mooney oh. III. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and of course, along with Pat Keegan, representing uh, Congressman uh, Lita Lowy, Pat. <laughs> and Susan Spear from Senator Julia Brand's office. Uh, I have to tell you, both the county and the congressional delegation have been nothing, lo nothing less than sensational in supporting this whole effort. Uh, They're in constant touch with us, uh, trying to figure out ways to help us. So this is the epitome, if, if you will, of what the nation ought to be doing. Here we have this collaborative effort on our four cities. We have the congressional delegation getting together, helping us. We have the county coming together, helping us. So this is a real terrific uh, uh, collaboration effort, that, that's for sure. Uh, anyway, I want to acknowledge uh, the leaders within the WCA who have been critical to this initiative. And the, uh, the chair of our Smart Growth Initiative overall, Bill Cuddy from CBRE. Bill. Uh, Bill has been very thoughtful in his leadership and insights as we go through this whole process. And specific to our broadband initiative, we would be lost without the technical guidance of uh, Chris Fisher. Chris, uh, Cuddy and Fader. I mean, half the time, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. I have to go to Chris and ask uh, the gigabits and all that stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, there are many, many technical questions, that's for sure. Uh, gigabit broadband, by the way, is the foundation for all smart growth initiatives. Uh, we need the right digital infrastructure with the capacity and speed to make us competitive in a new economy, the new infrastructure, if you will. Many people say gigabit is the new real estate. Uh, this is nothing less than revolutionary for our county. Across the United States, I think all of us know, the cities have been taking the lead in bringing gigabit brand broadband to their communities. And likewise, by joining together with the WCA and this monumental community effort, Westchester cities are taking a critical step in modernizing the digital infrastructure, closing the digital divide. 
And to me, that's probably one of the most important elements in this whole process, closing the digital divide. What I mean by that, there's so many of our uh, underserved who don't have access to infra uh, the uh, broadband. And, and as we go through this process, we will, we will, we will close the gap in terms of the digital divide. Uh, making our, our county competitive again, creating jobs and, and realizing, by the way, at the end of the day, municipal efficiencies. Hopefully the taxes will go down. That's what Tom promised me. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I now would like to take, turn the program over to John McDonald. Joan is the former New York State Commissioner of Transportation, former Commissioner of Economic and Development Community, uh, uh, Community Development for the State of Connecticut, and an Obama appointee to the National Infrastructure Advisory Council. And uh, Joan has been hired as our uh, strategic advisor and project manager for the whole blueprint for smart growth. And I have to tell you, as, re as important as her, and, 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 uh, her resume is, the substance of this lady is incredible. It is my delight really to work with her and watch her as she glides through this whole navigation process. So Joan, uh, Joan will fill you in and uh, give you the details about Blair. So, thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Bill. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what a wonderful day to be here uh, looking out uh, over our, our gorgeous Hudson Valley. And it has been a real privilege to work with the Westchester County Association and the cities of Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, White Plains, and Yonkers on this exciting initiative. L let me go back a couple of months and tell you how this all started. When we were looking at ways that we could partner with our cities, uh, as cities are taking the lead and making investments and moving the needle forward, uh, we, we took a look at the landscape and we saw that each of our four partner cities is a 30 minute train ride to Grand Central Terminal. Each of our four city partner mayors is leading his city with innovative approaches to transportation, land use, and economic development. So we asked the question, what will set us apart and position our communities for the 21st century and its innovative challenges and opportunities? That answer was high-speed internet and gigabit. Our Smart Cities Compact is the vehicle, pun intended, for us to work collaboratively on expanding high-speed internet to our communities. On October 6th, we launched our partnership to enthusiastic response. We have established a technical working group, many of whom are with, with us here today, within our cities. We are gathering data have reached out to the U.S. Department of Commerce for guidance on the evaluation process regarding what is the best approach from a technical standpoint, from a financial standpoint, and from a governance standpoint. All things that really excite me and stuff that I really enjoy doing. Um, we will be conducting our stakeholder meetings in the new year in 2017 to get input from business leaders, community leaders, and the community at large, uh, at a schedule we are very much looking forward to. As Bill mentioned, thanks to our partner and good friend, Bobby Knight, we are thrilled to have Blair Levin joining us as an advisor. Blair is a senior fellow with the Metropolitan Planning Program at Brookings Institute. He also serves as the executive director of gig.u the Next Generation Networking Innovation Project. GIGU is an in initiative of three dozen leading research university communities seeking to support educational and economic development by accelerating the deployment of next generation networks. Blair served as the Chief of Staff to the Chairman of the FCC from December 1993 through October 1997 where he, saw, where he oversaw the implementation of the 1996 Telecommunications Reform Act. And fast forward you know, almost 20 years and what a difference the world is today. The development of digital television standards and the first spectrum auctions, uh, an initiative that I've uh, been delving into a little bit more deeply. After eight years as an analyst at Leg Mason and Stifle Nicholas, Blair returned to the FCC in 2009 
where he developed the National Broadband Plan as part of the American Economic Recovery Act program. Hailed as a visionary document, the NBP set aggressive goals for broadband, many of which have been realized in an eight-year time period. Over the past six months, Blair has outlined an agenda for our next president and the role the federal government can continue to play in advancing broadband. We are thrilled that Blair is joining us. He will be providing his insights and his thoughts on lessons we can learn from his experience. A very warm welcome to Blair Levin. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, in Westchester County, where my wife grew up. Um, and in particular, it's a pleasure to be here because I've always regarded, or have in the last few years, have regarded this as um, the county that is represented by the single best state legislator in the country, um, Shelley Mayer. Maybe some of you know her. I probably should say Shelley's a cousin of mine. Uh, <laughs> and so I might be a little bit biased. I promise everything else I say will be totally objective and true, but we're very loyal within the family. I also feel bad, by the way, um, Jewish, I feel guilt. The people looking at this screen, you could be looking at something much more beautiful. Uh, my guilt is mitigated by the fact, however, that instead of my looking at that beautiful stuff, I, have to, I get to look at all of you, but, uh, but it, it truly is a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I also want to thank, thank you for that wonderful introduction in which you implied that the 1996 Act and, and my personal implementation of it was what is responsible for the fact that you now all, all have phones uh, in your pocket. Uh, and we do all kinds of wonderful things that we could not do in 1996. We had something to do with it, uh, but there were a lot of other things. It always amuses me when people in government say, I did this or I did that, because anyone who's worked in government knows it's a lot about we. Uh, it's a lot about coming together, and that's really the topic for the speech. Um, if I hit this, will I start? Will I? Do I, Are the slides embedded? Oops, there we are. Um, so I want to say that uh, I want to start by pointing out the last week I uh, was in Wilson, North Carolina at a conference on expanding the gigabit ecosystem. I wasn't there to make a partisan statement, but I began by agreeing with 75% of an assertion of one of the presidential candidates at that time, that it is time because it is always time uh, to make America great again, or make America great. Um, and I suggested that the real topic of that conference was how we make America great with great broadband. And that's also the topic today, though in the spirit of bipartisanship, which I think will exist for at least another 48 hours, uh, I would like to title this speech, uh, Stronger Together for and with Great Broadband. Uh, as I will discuss, I think that uh, this county will be much stronger uh, in its broadband efforts by virtue of the four cities coming together in a common effort. And I hope it's obvious to everybody, both here and in the county, that in this global information economy, we should aspire to assure that bandwidth never constrains economic growth or social progress. We need affordable, abundant bandwidth. You already understand that, which is why you've taken the steps you have. And they're very impressive steps, steps that put you at the forefront of all communities in delivering that affordable, abundant bandwidth for enterprises and residents. So congratulations on what you have already accomplished. So today I'd like to address four questions related to further steps along that journey. Uh, what's the impact of next generation broadband? Why not wait for current market forces to deliver it? What are some models that communities have used to accelerate deployment? And what are other steps that are useful in expanding the value of gigabit ecosystem? So what's been the impact of next generation broadband to date? Uh, we're in the early innings, um, but uh, in the last three years, North America has experienced record growth in gigabit-capable fiber, now reaching about 30 million homes, with the 2016 year-over-year -year growth of 16% tying the previous record set in 2008. This accelerated growth, uh, growth rate is actually not surprising given the value people place on quality broadband. A recent study showed that more than 90% of respondents said quality broadband was very important and choosing a community in which to live, second only to safe streets. And I might just note from an historic basis, 
if you think about it, five years ago or 10 years ago, it wasn't even on the list, and now it's number two. And the right to do so, because while most people answering that way don't know the underlying data, that data confirms the importance of great broadband for thriving as a place to work and live. The data indicates that improved broadband leads to improved metrics on a number of fronts, including economic growth and better jobs. Now, there's all kinds of anecdotal evidence that early gigabit adopters like Chattanooga and Kansas City are enjoying all kinds of growth and entrepreneurial activity and jobs associated with those networks. Tom Friedman wrote a great piece on this about Chattanooga um, and pointed out that in Chattanooga, by coming together to make the city an attractive place to live and getting both parties, all, everyone to agree to invest in a fiber to every home and business network, Chattanooga replaced its belching smokestacks with an Amazon.com fulfillment center, major healthcare and insurance companies, and a beehive of tech startups that all thrive on big data and super high-speed internet. And that it's taken a slowly declining and deflating urban balloon to one of the fastest growing cities in Tennessee. But it's not just uh, anecdotal evidence. A 2014 study showed that communities with widely available gigabit access enjoy per capita GDP that's 1.1% higher than communities with little or no access to such services. In dollar terms, the 14 gigabit uh, broadband communities studied enjoyed approximately 1.4 billion in additional GDP. Conversely, 41 communities in the study that didn't have it uh, forewent uh, GDP of about 3.3 billion. Another recent study concluded that it's particularly important for a fast-growing segment of home businesses where fiber averages about 73,000 revenues, almost double the second-place cable of 43. Uh, it also has uh, the impact of increased property values. Uh, a recent study uh, showed that very high-speed bandwidth uh, adds about $10,000 in value to, three, to a $300,000 family residence. It's the number one amenity sought by MDU homeowners. It's the number two amenity sought in the single-family homes. And again, a few years ago, it wasn't even on the list. Another example is uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. There, uh, the city created a public-private partnership with the city owning the conduit and the private sector owning the fiber. Uh, the system is made up of multiple sizes of pipe using such things as traffic conduit, abandoned water, wastewater lines. The system now has seven partners and has driven over $150 million in investment. Uh, it's created over 300 new jobs just on the fiber, uh, the network side, and is causing broadband prices to drop dramatically. Another model is um, what Huntsville, Alabama, and Westminster, Maryland uh, did. They designed, financed, and constructed a dark fiber network and are leasing that fiber to individual private parties, in Huntsville's case to Google, in Westminster's case to a small company named Ting, who then take on the responsibility for the, for the rest of the task. And I might note, because I think it's particularly relevant here, Huntsville was really being done by the municipally owned electric utility company. Electric uh, companies are key partners. They're a key partner in North Carolina with Google. Um, though also I should note in North Carolina, AT&T is also upgrading. Uh, Frontiers also has some of it, so it's a, there's a lot of private sector activity. But the electric co-ops, they have lines, they have trucks, they've got a lot of assets that are extremely valuable uh, in improving the economics. Um, other communities uh, have taken on the responsibility for all of these tasks, Lafayette, Louisiana, Cedar Falls, Iowa. They basically go into con uh, competition with existing providers rather than really doing a partnership. These tend to be uh, smaller rural communities. I think they're quite unlike Westchester. Some large communities I've talked to have looked at this model. Uh, none have adopted it. But in the early days, I would not take anything off the table. And I should note there are a lot of kind of different creative solutions. South Portland, Maine did a deal with a private local ISP in which, the in which the company agreed to basically undertake all the tasks, but the city agreed to become what is effectively an, uh, an anchor tenant of the gigabit network. Uh, because remember, cities have a number of different things which they need a network for, and it's always that kind of classic case of uh, lease or buy. Uh, they also receive about 20, they receive 25% of the profits in the overall enterprise. 
The fundamental trade-off for all of these things is risk and control. It's very simple. The more the community wants to control the outcome and all the different elements of it, the greater the risk the community must undertake. Conversely, the community can lower its risk profile, but it will inevitably have to give up um, uh, certain uh, elements of control. There's no generic answer to what is right for you. You have different assets, different ambitions, different demographic profiles than all the examples listed above. You have to do a certain kind of analysis uh, to determine what is best for you. In doing so, I'd urge you to remember three things. Um, first of all, you really are stronger together. I wasn't just stealing that from a, from a campaign, which maybe we'll remember that line, maybe we won't. Um, uh, but the, the important economic point is that scale matters. If only one town in Westchester were interested, it would be hard to garner, garner the attention of potential providers. By virtue of greater scale, you'll, you'll get greater attention. Um, and I know this because the incumbents in your community already called me up to ask me what I was going to say today. Um, <laughs> actually, it was funny. In the early days when I was doing gig.u, I would go visit these towns, and within 48 hours, the mayor would always get a phone call of like, so do you have any schools you want us to connect or anything like this? And this is also a trade-off of do you take the quick and easy or do you take the long-term view? But I thought I could really, um, maybe uh, a friend of mine was running Google Fiber and I said, you know, if we just coordinate our schedules, we'll cause an upgrade in the entire country just by publishing our, um, the communities that we're visiting. But, but it is absolutely true that you're, you're going to get attention uh, of incumbents. And that leads me to my second point, which is, it's a complicated relationship with the incumbent providers. Progress. There are many paths up the mountain. I suspect many in this room have better ideas than I would as to how Westchester should proceed. But let me offer a couple of thoughts based on my experiences with other, um, other communities. Uh, first, get everybody on. Adoption is a vexing problem, combining elements of affordability, literacy, and relevance. It's also viral. The more the members of a community are on, the greater the incentives for others to get on. The key thing is once, universi once universality is achieved, it opens the door to all kinds of community improvements not available to communities that are half on and half off. The FCC's reform of its Lifeline program to subsidize broadband for low-income individuals, and there are many other successful community adoption programs, creates new opportunities and new models for achieving this goal. Second, use the platform to better deliver public goods and services. All large enterprises are moving off the old analog platform, moving strictly to the digital platform. If you want to sell something, if you want a job, if you want information from them, you have to be online. They don't do this because they are nerds. They do it because it improves their ability to constantly improve how they deliver goods and services. Government, because it has to serve everyone, cannot migrate as easily. Another reason it's important to get everyone on. But government should also aspire to constantly improve how itself de it delivers goods and services. This means ending the era of lines and paper and making all government services web-based, providing greater transparency, being always on, and above all, using more reliable data to improve performance. Third, help every enterprise become a networked, empowered enterprise. Amazingly, many small businesses are not online. This not only cuts their ability to sell, it makes it difficult for the improved efficiency in buying, operating, and accounting made possible by cloud-based services. Not every company needs to be a web-based company, but every company can benefit from services now available on the web. And fourth, and you guys are actually really ahead on this, make sure your network accommodates the next technology shifts. So you're starting from the right perspective, which is, how do we have smart cities? Not how do we have a network, but how do we have smart cities? And the answer is you got to have a good network. But it's not just about the fiber gigabit network. There are two great new networks that are going to be built over the next few years. One is the fifth generation mobile network, and the second is the Internet of Things, and specifically the civic Internet of Things, which adds intelligence to our transportation, water, sewer, uh, and other civic, infra uh, civic infrastructure. Both have a need for and will operate over the fiber networks that you are producing. So now is the time to start making sure that uh, that network and the design element uh, services those emerging needs. 
In closing, let me be clear that having a gigabit network will not solve all the problems that we face, uh, addressing other challenges from climate change to quality of education to affordable housing to the ability to attract an educated and diverse workforce, among many other things, are all critical issues to be part of a policy agenda. But at some point in the near future, the kind of network that you've started working on, one that literally thousands of communities wish they already had, will be the new table stakes for addressing both the challenges, those challenges and the opportunities of this century to build a better life for ourselves and our children and for generations to follow. And when those generations arrive, I hope that America is still great. I hope its residents in the world will see it as a shining city of the hill of which Reagan and other presidents spoke and that we've actually aspired to since the days before the country was created. It goes back to 1630 in a sermon, a model of Christian charity that John Winthrop gave to his fellow Puritans on the um, uh, ship, the Arabella. And I feel confident that as we move to that shining city on the hill, particularly since we're actually on kind of a shiny city on the hill right now, uh, you all will be a big part of that story. And as the great Yankee Yogi Berra usefully reminded us, predictions are tricky, particularly about the future. <laughs> but these two predictions are 100% certain. Um, America will not be great if it does not have great broadband. And we will not get it if we don't work together. Thank you very much. Happy. You all should be eating, but I'm happy to answer questions. I'm, I'm quite used to uh, answering questions while other people eat. It's been an occupational thing for me for a lot of years. I will only say, don't take away my food, but particularly don't take away my dessert. And, <laughs> And I, uh, uh, I'm happy to start answering questions. Can you explain what you meant by the fifth generation mobile network? Sure. So the device you all have in your pocket is uh, what's called a fourth generation device. A lot of you have a, a, it's used the technology, a protocol called LTE. First generation's phone, some of you are as old as I am and can remember those little phones that basically were voice. And then you moved to second generation, which had some text, third generation that had data fourth generation, much faster, but still significantly slower than the kind of broadband you have in your office and at your home. So we're moving to a fifth generation of mobile broadband. The FCC has put aside some spectrum for it. But here's the really important thing to understand. The fundamental architecture of the network is different. In generations one, two, three, four, you have very tall towers that hit, let's call it 10,000 homes, OK? had its complexities, a lot of communities didn't like those towers. You could talk about all this, you've, you've been engaged in this, but, but that's the architecture. Fifth generation is going to be approximately 100 times faster. But the way we get there is we move something much closer to what you have in your homes. You have fiber going deep into the network, it hits usually what's called a Wi-Fi modem, and then you get a smaller area. So think of it this way. You have the tower architecture on one side hitting 10,000 homes. You have the Wi-Fi architecture hitting a single home. And what, why, what fifth generation does is you drive fiber deeper right about to here. That is to say, in some models it's 10 homes, in some models it's 100. But you drive fiber deeper and you have a small cell architecture that then hits all those homes. The point is you're going to need fiber to be deeper in the network. Now, by the way, all of those towers are attached to fiber. And we talk about uh, a mobile network. That's actually a lie. The network is not mobile. You're mobile. <laughs> but the tower, is, one hopes, is staying in the same place and is not moving around. But it's most of the bits, most of the time the bits are traveling, they're actually traveling on a wired network. With fifth generation, they travel even a greater percentage of their time over the wired network, and that's why the fiber deployment that you're doing is extremely valuable for, for the development of that network. Go ahead. Do you feel that the ongoing debate around net neutrality affects the planning for smart communities in general? Is it a factor that we need to be taking into account? No. 
I don't. <laughs> it's funny, I, I, uh, I was a Wall Street analyst. I wrote the first piece for Wall Street um, uh, on net neutrality in 2002. Unfortunately, I did not name it net neutrality, so uh, it wasn't until the spring of 2003 that my friend and New York resident, um, Tim Wu, um, uh, wrote an article about net neutrality, and now he's famous, and I just do this stuff. But, uh, but I'm here today, so I'm very grateful for that. Anyway, my point is, I, I've been following that debate for a lot of years. And I've been, both been a commentator, but also in government processes. I have, um, I looked at the world in terms of the broadband plan, that there were three fundamental challenges. How do we get affordable, abundant bandwidth everywhere? How do we get everybody on? How do we use the platform better to deliver public goods and services? Those are the three core issues to me. But I will tell you that to most of the political environment of on, bra on internet, net neutrality was the fundamental issue, which fundamentally, for those of you who don't know, it involves the question of when a network delivers something to you, do they do it on a non-discriminatory basis? Or are they allowed to essentially charge more or even block or throttle certain kinds of uh, material? We could have a long discussion of that. Um, the FCC seemed to have settled it back in 2014 when they voted to adopt a certain rule, which was then upheld by the courts. Um, and we thought the issue was dead, but I will note that the president-elect uh, said he doesn't like net neutrality and wants to reverse it. The reason why I don't think it matters, and I am in a very significant minority in this regard, I'm probably one of the leading commentators on broadband policy and the only one who doesn't think net neutrality is actually that important, um, is because when you look at the equation of what, the, what drives the networks, it's not really in there. Proponents say it absolutely is in there because if people don't have access to all kinds of information, they're not going to buy it and therefore the economics are hurt. The opponents say if you micromanage how the companies operate their networks or make a product or constrain how they operate, you, you hurt the economics of deployment. In my experience on Wall Street and watching this stuff and with gig.u, I don't, I, don't, I don't see that anywhere in evidence. The equations that I drew were, came out of our experiences. But having said that, you can expect another round of uh, a lot of political capital. I think actually Congress, by the way, is likely to rewrite the 96 Telecom Act, which I'm perfectly fine with. Um, the, the, that act was actually written at almost precisely the worst time because it was at the very beginning of the Internet and we were really just focused on local and long distance. Um, so I don't have any problem with them rewriting it and maybe they'll resolve it in a way. But from your perspective, driving fiber deeper makes, makes sense under a Trump presidency and would make exactly the same sense under a Clinton presidency if that had happened. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, the incumbents are enjoying high prices for their services now. How do we incentivize uh, some of those players to build our system? Uh, we're going to be driving their prices now. Yeah, uh, uh, let me, if, if, if that's what you heard, then I said it slightly wrong. I don't want to characterize their prices as high or as low or as medium. If we look at the world, you could say, um, we're, we're not the highest, but we're certainly not the cheapest. But there are a lot of factors that go into that price, and so I don't want to characterize it that way. What I meant to say, and I appreciate the question, is that what the companies have found is there's a certain willingness to pay, and in terms of what people are willing to do to get a certain kind of um, broadband. And if you were, excuse me, if you are a premium user, and I suspect most of the people in this room are, you will you know, devote more of your income to broadband because it's really important to you and you use it a lot and the actual incremental dollars between say 70 or 80 bucks a month actually isn't that important to you. If you are on a much more limited basis uh, uh, budget, as most Americans are, um, there's a big difference between 70 and 30. And so you're gonna buy the low end product. But these are both priced to maximize return on their investment, which is what every company does. And so the, the, there simply is not an economic incentive to invest a lot of capital to build a new network where 
your price points are still 70 and 30 is a way of express. It's more complicated than that, but that's, a, that's the basic thing. So the question is, how do you get the incumbents to want to do this? And I could tell you a lot of stories. Um, you know, in the Research Triangle Park, we did this we did this thing, and it kind of leaked out that Google was bidding, and then AT&T decided that they were going to build out. <laughs> Amazing. So it turns out that the last part of the equation, the threat of competitive losses, is very, very important. And I would note that in 100% of the communities where Google Fiber has either built out or said they were going to build out, the incumbent telco and the incumbent cable company responded. Now, it's complicated. They haven't built out everywhere, but that's if there's one thing you can do, it's to bring in a competitive threat. But that's not always true. We, uh, in College Station, Texas, we put out an RFP, and just the putting out of the RFP scared the incumbent cable company into, uh, but partly because, frankly, Google was in Austin, which was not that far away. Um, but there are other, other things. Um, you know, you, you, you look at your incumbents and you say to them, we're going to get this one way or the other. What do you think is the best way to do it? Now, they could say to you is just wait for us to do it. That's probably not a very good answer. They could say you could charge us nothing for rights of way. Maybe that makes sense, but don't do that unless they actually have a binding commitment to build, right? In other words, there's like a 27-page agreement between Google and Kansas City, which was the core document for things that Kansas City agreed to do uh, to help lower the cost. It includes all kinds of very technical things. I'll just cite one example. In any construction project, there's a phase transition. You move from phase A to phase B. You cannot begin phase B unless the local government says that you did phase A properly, as well they should. If, you, if your people are sitting around for four days between phase A and B, it adds to the cost. If the city commits to be there within two hours of your saying a phase is done, it lowers the cost. Kansas City did that, probably raised the cost of constructing other things, but they really wanted that gigabit network. They made that choice. There are a number of things that you can do, but um, the most important thing, I think, in any negotiation is to communicate to the other side, we're going to do this. We're going to have this. If we, can do, if we do it with you, great. But if you don't want to do it on a timely basis in a way that we want, we'll do it with somebody else. Uh, with these higher bandwidth systems, is there also increased uh, concern about security, and in particular cyber security, so these systems don't get shut down? Um, if I were uh, coming out of law school, I, I graduated law school in 1980. If I were coming out of law school today, I probably would be saying I should either go into drone law or cybersecurity law. Drone law is more fun. Cybersecurity is going to be, I mean, I don't really know this, but I'm just going to say it because we're now in an era where if you just say things, they... <laughs> you, you could become president. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going to assert the single fastest growing part of uh, the American economy and every economy is investment in cybersecurity. Might be true. Uh, but I, I mean this in all seriousness. Cybersecurity is going to be uh, a huge topic. We're going to have a cybersecurity equivalent of 9-11 or Pearl Harbor. Uh, we're all going to be affected by it at various points in time. It is actually less of an issue in the gigabit fiber portion of the network it is a huge issue in what we call the Internet of Things, where you have lots and lots of devices, and not all of them are going to be highly secure. And once you get in, you know, um, as somebody kind of memorably said, the biggest threat to us today is our toasters. Because once we put them on, <laughs> and we're going to, you're going to have toasters on the Internet, I guess. Um, you know, you can, people can get you through the toasters. That's, that is not in the necessarily the network deployment. It does affect the economics of how we use it, but uh, I would argue, and I'm sure I'm, this is something I have a high level of conviction on, you're going to need the fiber anyway. It's not, the problem isn't the fiber, the problem is the systems. Where does, there are lots of people spending lots of money figuring out how best to do it, and of course the problem is, as Clinton and the Democratic Party found out, there are lots of people on the other side figuring out how to break in. So, 
that's way above my pay grade. And um, but uh, it's it's absolutely essential that people think about that as well. Um, so here's the amusing thing. I'm currently a fellow at the Metropolitan Policy Project at the Brookings Institute, having written a national broadband plan and consulted with a number of countries on national broadband plans. But one of the things that I learned um, was that the most important player in broadband policy is actually cities. Some, slightly counterintuitive, but let me illustrate by just saying, again, three questions. How do you get affordable, abundant bandwidth everywhere? How do you get everybody on? Um, how do you use it better to deliver goods and services? As to the first question, the wired networks, cities affect that equation much more than the federal government. Federal government does certain things, poll attachment policy and some other things, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a construction project. Cities absolutely affect that. Second, how do you get everybody on? Very much of a local issue. Oh, I should say, in terms of networks, there's also wireless networks, much more federal because spectrum is a federal asset. But the single most important piece of spectrum today, by which I mean the spectrum over which most bits travel, are actually Wi-Fi. And that is created by fiber or by other wired networks. So again, cities have a huge role in effectively creating both the wired and the wireless networks that we use. Getting everybody on, cities play a larger role because it's very community-based. Using it better, the, the parts of the economy that could really use uh, an upgrade in terms of how we do these things are largely local government, public safety, education, health care. Um, so the federal government plays an important role, but the cities are really where the rubber meets the road. Um, now, states also play a role. We've always had a kind of a curious system. Telecommunications largely uh, regulated on a federal and state level. Cable largely regulated on a federal and local level. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, and, and uh, actually I'm working with the state, in a couple weeks we're going to release a, uh, uh, it's a small state, uh, uh, release something talking about how this state can become a 5G ready state. But it's really all about the same issue. How do you collaborate with industry to lower the cost of deployments, to keep people safe, to not have constant, um, you know, one of the things that cities are concerned about is they don't want to have their streets torn up by lots and lots of different people, but they also want a lot of competition. Well, that's the kind of tension that you all are going to get to deal with and hopefully teach the rest of the country a good way of doing it. Uh, thanks, Blair. Uh, first of all, I'd love to see that 27-page document here in New York. It would be 2,700 pages. <laughs> Back to the research uh, triangle model. It, it seemed, given our area, the significant cost of whether it be land acquisition, infrastructure improvements, labor, whatever it might be, it seemed that that model of a partnership, the things you've talked about, ease of access by the government, yeah. public amenities, as uh, partnered with the private sector investment, it seemed like that would be the type of model that may work best here. But I was concerned, I thought you said that that model was moving increasingly away from likelihood due to lack of competition. Yes. Um, do you think, I don't know if you're equipped to answer, but do you think that's a model that might work here? Some of the experts might know much better than I. Number one and number two, why would that not work because of the decreased competition? Yeah. So what my life's experiences have taught me is that when trying to answer a question like that, I'm kind of an idiot, uh, which is to say I don't know the answer. What we did with the National Broadband Plan, what we did with KidGotU, frankly, what we did with Spectrum Auctions all have the same philosophical tenet, which is how do you have a process that delivers the right answer? You know, um, for years, we allocated Spectrum as a country uh, we, during the Roosevelt years, when radio was becoming important, the FCC allocated spectrum. Totally a coincidence that most of the owners of radio stations were Democrats in those years. Uh, similarly, when television became important uh, in the 50s, the FCC allocated spectrum. Totally a coincidence that most of the TV owners were Republican. It's just amazing. <laughs> but it was done through, like, competitive bids, whatever that meant. Uh, and then we went to lotteries and stuff. We finally got smart. And in 1994, started doing what a famous economist proposed in 1959, which is we auctioned it, because it turned out the market answered a lot of these questions. Who's the highest and best use? I'm a big believer in that. And what I would say to you is, 
don't try to answer that question when you don't know the answer. What you want to do is you want to design, whether you think of it as a request for information followed by a request for a proposal, you, you, you want to design, you want to give people the incentive to invest time to give you better answers. As I sit here today, I don't think the Research Triangle thing could have worked but for Google's commitment. And that's a very fast-growing, great demographics, great universities. Google's withdrawal has definitely caused the incumbents to feel a little like we're, we're fine. We don't have to respond. But I could be wrong about that because, as you say, this is a very attractive area. Um, it's going to be growing. It's going to be important. It's going to support people. I mean, from their perspective, they want to have these networks because we're going to move into virtual reality and multiple player game and 8K and all kinds of things, you know, that some college kid is going to invent. Um, so that might work. I wouldn't take anything off the table. I'm just telling you that, you know, the probabilities, you watch the different things that affect kind of the, uh, uh, how folks do it. But again, if you have... I think the Lincoln thing is, is a good example where the city was building out a lot of its own network for its own purposes. And then by putting in conduit, they allowed other people to put it in really cheaply. That really helped a lot. So there are a lot of different things you can do uh, to improve the economic climate. Thank you. Uh, Blair, uh, you talked a lot about some of the cities that are moving forward and the regions that are moving forward. What are some of the common pitfalls that you've seen and, and things that we should be wary about as we embark on our journey here? Yeah. So um, we, we actually, uh, Gig you published a, a handbook. It's available on the web. We're coming out with a new version of it, um, kind of an up, updated version of it uh, in a few weeks. And I went through, I think, about 10 of them. And so I'm going to try to remember three from the 10, but there's a, there's a number of them. One is political expectations. We, as a society, uh, and I'm really sympathetic to people who actually are willing to run for office and be mayor. Uh, it's a really hard thing. Um, but they have certain kinds of incentives, just like companies have incentives, to do things in a time cycle that is not realistic. This is a long-term thing. And the challenge is, how do you get people excited about something where they're not going to see the benefits to three to five years? That's actually really hard. And so sometimes there's a tendency to overpromise. And then there's this kind of like the, 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 you know, the hype cycle where things get hyped and then they get disappointed and then they you know, slowly roll it out. And uh, you know, Bill Gates and others have famously said, we tend to overestimate change in a two-year window. We tend to underestimate in a 10-year window. That's just a normal human psychology about the way we look at it. So number one is threading the needle of creating political expectations. Um, number two is understanding the trade-offs. Because a lot of times people think we can have our cake and eat it too, uh, particularly in the political realm, and we can't. Uh, as I tried to illustrate, if you want certain things, you're going to have to give up other things. That's just the way it works. But sometimes in a political environment, uh, it's hard to do that. And then the, the third thing I would say is that uh, it is a challenge dealing with incumbents, and it's a challenge dealing with the new guys. Um, we had a couple of things that didn't work well uh, with Gig.U where we were working with new folks because it turned out the cost of them simply leaving was too low. They made promises, they couldn't deliver, and they walked away. Now, it turns out n nobody was really hurt that much by it but um, uh, because of the way the contracts work, but it was po a political embarrassment. The incumbents have a much bigger cost to them of not achieving what they promise. On the other hand, and again, I'm not pointing to any individual company. A number of the incumbents have said various things that they were going to do certain things, and then they, they didn't, and there's an argument about all of that. So trying to, if, if, you, if you try to get everybody to, you know, actually have an ironclad promise where they promise to give you their third child if they don't, you know, all that, it's going to not work. It won't work that way. On the other hand, if it's too loose, it's too easy to walk away, that's a problem. So threading those needles of political expectations of the right trade-offs and the dealing with the problems of both incumbents and new entrants, I would say, are three things that come to mind. Yeah? Question about one versus multiple providers. What yes. are the advantages and disadvantages for us to have one as the major driver versus multiple? 
Yeah, it's a great question. By the way, has anyone ever told you you look a lot like the current chairman of the FCC? Who also wears swe sweaters, by the way. Pardon? I would introduce myself, but I have not heard that. Before. Okay. Uh, we, should, uh, we should bring you to the next time he gives a great speech and see if we can pull it off. We could cause the stock market to really crash. It would be great. Uh, or cause it to go up. That would be even greater. Uh, so this is a really great question uh, because at various points in time, uh, economists speak of a thing called natural monopolies. There are certain things that they view as natural monopolies. They generally have the following characteristics. They have very high capital expenditures, zero economic uh, cost. So that for a road, very expensive to build, but once you've built it, you don't care how many cars go over it. Water, sewer, these are things that are thought of as natural monopolies. And generally, they are either a function of government or they are heavily regulated. <coughs> For many years, we thought telephone was a natural monopoly. In 1913, the Justice Department um, settled its first antitrust suit with AT&T by essentially giving them a monopoly in exchange for them agreeing to certain conditions such as interconnecting mm -hmm. with other local companies and um, doing all kinds of things. The problem is that in our country we have two networks and we're, we're lucky to have them. One, the, vo the voice network, and the other is the cable network that was designed for video. And they were both jerry-rigged, and I don't mean this in a negative way, I mean this in kind of that I love the movie The Martian, you know, science can conquer all. That guy, you know, Matt Damon just jerry-rigged his whole life on, on Mars, and it was great. So these guys, the companies, interesting story about why they did it and how they did it, but they jerry-rigged their networks to be able to deliver data. But they didn't build them to deliver data. But because they exist today, we're not doing, it doesn't make sense for us to do what you would do if you had a blank piece of paper. What I would say is, this is a question that ought to be addressed in whatever process you do, which is, what is it that we can do that only we can do and that gives, creates a competitive marketplace and, an, and a dynamic marketplace and an innovative marketplace? But people are not going to compete on the basis of conduit. This is, what, this is the genius of what Lincoln, Nebraska did. No one's going to compete for that. So they just build it because they're building out their roads anyway. Or you know, redoing their sewer pipes anyway. Um, I think that's a, that's a good model, uh, but how it works for you, that's, uh, that's what the process has to really say. But clearly on the service level, you want a lot of competition, and, you know, where, where you want the competition to really start, you don't, comp no one competes on the basis of rights-of-way management, only the cities do that, right? Other questions, yeah? Uh -huh. how the local university can play a role in the Gigabyte initiatives. Yeah. So Gigabyte, you started, um, while we were doing the plan, I kind of was did this analysis and said, I don't, I don't see how we get to faster networks. Uh, we're going to continue to have networks with constrained economic growth and social progress. And in some of the discussions, particularly with Google, they said, yeah, you're right, and we really need to change that. And they, I said, what should we do about it? And they said, you should get Congress to give you $250 million to do a demo project, and it'll be great. Everyone will love it. Everyone will want it, and that'll be that. I said, uh, that's a great idea. Have you looked at this Congress? Uh, I don't think they're going to give me 250 And by the way, if they gave it to me, what would I do with it? And, and I'll, by the way, I also don't think that's enough. And to their credit, they said, uh, you know, you're right. We'll do it. We said, great. So they announced the Google Fiber thing uh, right at the time we were finishing up the plan. And I was concerned that all we sh as a country, we shouldn't just bet on one company. Uh, and so uh, when 1,100 communities applied, a group of us in the plan kind of got together and said, wow, all these communities want this. What, what if we were to reverse what Google is doing? Instead of having it from the supply side, we take a small group from the demand side that has the best demographics, the best existing networks, the best political environment, a number of other criteria, and of course that turned out to be university towns, and then we went out and got a bunch to join. And uh, initially it was going to be a national thing, but it turns out state laws make that really difficult. 
And so you had a bunch of different experiments. The real value of it was you had a lot of local government officials talking to each other about how to make it possible. So what I told you about Research Triangle, uh, it's not an accident. Google's in um, Atlanta where we had Georgia Tech or Nashville where there's Vanderbilt or um, uh, uh, Champaign-Urbana did their own little project, uh, which is kind of interesting. They were uh, taking some stimulus dollars and then they built out a network. And um, But a bunch of other cities, Seattle, Chicago, around the universities, the thing about universities is, number one, you have high demand for bandwidth. A lot of professors use a lot of uh, information, and, and so they're, they're a driver. And the universities are usually, uh, if you look at the data points that I noted, um, if you, universities, it's interesting, they have a culture of sharing. They also are the most competitive of entities of anyone I know, UNC and Duke compete not just on the basketball court, as we all know, but also for professors, for students, for uh, research grants. If Chapel Hill has a gigabit and Durham doesn't, that's actually, that's a, that's a big problem for Durham. So, um, so they were all pretty interested in, in trying to do this. But what I would say is they, they, they bring a lot to the table, but their networks are on campus and they're often constrained from uh, sharing them sometimes. But if you can tap into their networks, you can create very robust networks relatively quickly. Hope that answered your question. Any, any other questions, or do I get to eat lunch now? Have I, have I talked to lunch? Have I talked to lunch? <laughs> I don't know about you all, but uh, that was probably one of the best Q and A's I've seen in a long time on such a technical subject, and made it made it reasonably un easy to understand. I hope you enjoyed the uh, program. Uh, continue to finish. everybody got their dessert yet? Uh, okay, it's a, it's a three pound dessert. Uh, <laughs> I'm feeling it already. I might add, but anyway, uh, our thanks to Blair. What a wonderful job he has done here today, and uh, he'll be working with us as we go through the program. Right after this meeting, by the way, we have a working group project team uh, who will be getting together with Blair and go through the process. And we'll be communicating to a lot of people as we go through this process. Uh, what else should I say? I think that's it. Huh? What do you think? Uh, thank you for being here.